Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Wine with Jimmy channel here. Thank you so much for stopping by. I am your host, Jimmy Smith. So welcome to one of our series here on the WSET Level 4 Diploma. Now, this is, in fact, the first video of the large section on wine production, wine making. So we have another 80, 90 videos uh, to the wine um, grape growing section, the viticulture, but this is all about wine making. So it begins here. Uh, this video is available uh, for free on YouTube, but all forthcoming videos after this in this series are only available on my e-learning portal that's www.winewithjimmy.com and click on the e-learning portal. If you do have any comments or questions or concerns, you can get in touch with me here uh, by actually commenting on this video on YouTube. Make sure you click the subscribe button as well for many updates and new videos on a weekly basis or by the social media that you'll see at the bottom of every slide or direct at www.winewithjimmy.com. Okay, so let's begin with wine production here, looking at the wine components. Then on this section, on part one, we are looking at water, the major part of a grape, uh, but not mightily important for um, the key things that uh, will be discussed. Alcohol, of course, the all given alcohol and then acids, which really is the biggest section here on part one, talking about acidity and the key components. So um, the forthcoming parts on the wine aromatics and then residual sugar, glycerol and phen uh, phenolics are only available, as I mentioned, at my e-learning portal, where there is a whole host of other wonderful stuff, such as flashcards, revision sessions, and also short written answer questions and answers of them. Okay, so let's begin here at the first section. So wine is made up of a complex array of compounds, of course, some of which have come directly from the grapes and others which have actually been formed during the fermentation process, um, or even added uh, by the winemaking part of the process. Uh, so the main groups of all the compounds that we'll uh, look at for wine production are gonna be discussed over these three parts, of course. So first of all, and we will get this done first to get it out of the way, but water, of course. And on the left-hand side, you'll see a bottle which has been full, uh, it's about two thirds full. And uh, this is to represent the key parts that we find within a bottle of wine. And wine is approximately 85% of water by volume, depending of course of the other factors such as ABV and residual sugar and so on. Uh, the water is very critical for the way the wine flows as a liquid, of course, but also the amount of water could have quite an impact in the intensity and concentration of that wine style. Alcohol comes next, of course. So ethanol is formed during fermentation and is the predominant alcohol in the wine and I suppose it has a slightly sweet smell. Ethanol contributes a little sense of sweetness and bitterness and what we would describe as warmth in the mouth. So uh, of course when we decipher if wines are low or medium or high alcohol in terms of systematic approach, we talk about that warmth in the mouth and associate it with warming factors. For example, Gewürztraminer. When Gewürztraminer, which commonly has that high alcohol and it displays it, you often get that kind of hot ginger spice characteristic that comes through, which I think is quite commonly linked with that. Also, alcohol is said to make a contribution of fullness to the body of the wine and also mouthfeel. So when discussing body, we talk about it after deciphering the alcohol because that can be a major factor in deciphering what we think the body is overall. And then there are high alcohols, so higher alcohols, 
14.5% and above uh, can actually reduce the volatility of wine aromas. So that's the intensity of wine aromas and increase the sense of bitterness of the wine on the palate. Uh, wines that do have these uh, compounds of higher alcohols will need balancing factors, otherwise the wine will seem very out of balance. Uh, and that is, of course, things like fruit concentration. There are also traces of other higher alcohols, which can have quite a pungent smell as well. Uh, and both ethanol and the higher alcohols can actually contribute to the aromas of wine. So that's talking about alcohol. Well, we put approximately 13% there on average, but of course that number can differ. And then the big category here is about acids. So the principal acids in wine are the two that it says there, tartaric and malic acid, accounting for say somewhere around two thirds, 70% or so of the wine's acidities. And those two, tartaric and malic, come from the grape itself. Now, other acids such as lactic and acetic acid are actually produced during fermentation or the malolactic conversion process. Uh, so they're acids that we could potentially talk about depending on the wine style. And acids uh, are, are in that group of all the other compounds. So water and alcohol really accounting for somewhere around 87, 80, uh, sorry, 97, 98% of the wine. And these other compounds, two to 3%, including of course, flavors and aromas, uh, things like acids, tannins, etc., etc. So what of then of the major acids? Let's go through those. So the levels of individual acids can greatly affect the taste of wine. So I've not discussed tartaric here. Tartaric is the major acidity that we do find, but I want to talk about how certain acidities can really affect the, uh, the wine style. So malic acid is one that's quite, quite distinctive. So high levels of malic acid could give a wine that very sort of direct and quite firm acidity. And that can contribute to a real fundamental base of that style of wine. So typically, of course, cool climate Chardonnay and of course Chablis classically is, has that kind of very linear, direct and firm acidity. Um, but the malolactic could be blocked in, uh, in those styles to really maintain that freshness. But in places like Chablis, of course, malolactic is actually becoming a bit more frequent to make wines that are a little bit more softer. So it, it depends, of course. And there are varieties, I've mentioned Chardonnay there that can. I want to mention another one, which I think is a really interesting one because it has very high percentages. And this is the variety called Carricante. Now, those of you that are very, very uh, keen on your Italian wines will know that Carracante is the variety from Etna DOC and surrounding DOCs such as Farro in Sicily. Uh, so it's a variety which is mightily important in crafting those beautiful, fresh Etna Biancos. Uh, and Caracante has been described in, in many, many texts, going back to the Roman times, as a variety that is so acidic and so high in malic acid that certain techniques need to be applied to actually soften out its characteristics. So that's things like malolactic conversion or lees contact, for example, which will help, help soften the sharp acids. But you, they do retain some of this malic acid, these wines, and that's why you'll taste Caracante making these gorgeously fresh styles, which is difficult to think about when you think that normally this malic acid is a compound that you may find in the coldest of places and not a hot Sicilian um, area. But altitude and volcanic soils have something to say about that as well. So there are varieties that do have these higher malic acid components. And what about the terminologies around volatile acids? So volatile acidity mainly refers to acetic acid, which we have there at the top, which links to that kind of 
vinegar smell and i've got a bit of a bottle of sarsen's malt vinegar there to be specific uh, although of course some other may contribute uh, to those smells as well other compounds also so this is um, present in all wines generally in very low concentrations and would only be deemed a fault when it is in excess now volatile acids sometimes are quite important to the wine style so there are more traditional or skin contact uh, vino macerato macerated styles uh, where they do not tend to control the temperatures and they believe that the sort of essence of that volatile acid is actually a big part of the wine style so of course it may be that fairly high amounts may be really pivotal for the style but for some people it may seem too excessive so it could be considered a fault for for some people uh, and acetic acid in turn reacts with the alcohol in the wine and that is where we get ethyl acetate that you'll see at the bottom of your slide there which is that kind of nail varnish remover smell that you may find on some wines and that's also perceived as a fault when when in excess i i find that sometimes very difficult to get past because it can be exceptionally concentrated and strong and um, what about lactic acid so this is another acidity which can be produced during the wine making stage so during malolactic uh, conversion the lab which is our um, lactic bacteria may convert the malic acid to lactic acid uh, and this gives a softer tasting style wine and maybe less powerful type of acidity. Um, and in some instances, acetic acid can be produced also with the lactic acid. And that's what we call lactic souring. And that gives a kind of a sour milk smell and would be deemed as a problem and a fault. There is also a pH shift as well. Uh, and a loss of acidity. So, of course, you are converting that very sort of intense, bright malic acid into a lactic acid that is said to change the acidity. Uh, and the typical pH shift will be around 0.1 to 0.3 increasing. So that means it's losing its acidity. Of course, pH, the, uh, the potential of hydrogen within the wine is kind of the concentration of the acidity. So if you're losing it by about 0.1 to 0.3, then you are, and, and that means increasing the number, maybe some, from 3.1 to 3.4 or something like that, then of course that is going to be some set, sense of perceived loss of acidity. Now, malolactic fermentation will occur in nearly all red wines, but of course is a choice whether it happens in white wines and is a stylistic decision choice. Uh, in uh, in our whites. Um, now just talking a little bit about acidity and balance as well. And we've got that just here. So acidity, of course, can contribute to the, the whole wine and the structure of the wine. It makes wines, of course, refreshing and should be in balance with the fruit concentration and, if it's present, the residual sugar depending, of course, on the philosophy of the wine producing style in that given area. High acidity um, also makes a wine appear quite lean, quite direct uh, on the palate and can often lead to the consumer or taster experiencing lean green characteristics in the wine or sometimes mineral mineral laid characteristics things like flint wet stones oyster shells and briny characteristics excessive acid so let's say above high acidity will make the wine taste tart and of course no doubt you've been in a scenario where somebody in a tasting room or you're with somebody who has tasted a wine and gone oh that's really tart uh, and that's maybe more of a sensitivity to the acidity of course each of us has very different sensitivities so it may be that for some people excessive acid may be present and for others it's a manageable high acidity on the other side of the pendulum swing lacking acidity in a wine will make, make the wine taste flat 
or flabby, it, it kind of loses its life force. It's really the, the freshness, the liveliness that is lost. So that's what we mean by the terminology flabby there. The perception of acidity uh, with dryness is related not just to the level of acidity, but also between the acidity and residual sugar if the wine has residual sugar. So of course, for some German Rieslings, typically in the Mosul, uh, they may taste drier despite having quite significant levels of residual sugar, sometimes up to around nine grams per liter. And that's because of the elevated acidity. And I've tasted many um, wonderful Chenin Blancs from the Loire Valley, which are actually classified uh, as something like a demi-sec, um, but actually when you taste it, dry is relatively like a sec, a very dry style, or a molleur, and actually tastes more like a demi-sec. And we do this commonly at the, uh, when we have winemakers at the school, we ask them, you know, uh, or they ask, in fact, the group, they say, how much, as, uh, how much um, sweetness do you think is in this wine? And maybe they say, uh, you know, below five grams per litre, 10, 15, 20, or 25 plus. Uh, and in fact, often it's 25 plus, but most people put it down at the other end because of the acidity, which detracts from that sweetness level. Um, acidity and pH. So let's just talk about a few things here around um, TA, total acidity, also uh, titratable acidity as well. Uh, and pH. So total acidity, here we put it as TA, um, is the combined sum of all the titratable and volatile acids present in that wine style. Whereas pH is the concentration of the free hydrogen ions in a solution. So although they are linked, they are not always correlated. Um, and um, of course, you can look at the fact that you have, um, you know, generally speaking, you have lower pHs and therefore higher acidities, but it's not as easy as that. Um, and mainly this is due to the buffering effect of other molecules that you find within wine, such as potassium, for example. Um, so usually high acidity would be a wine with low pH. Um, but pH also is important when we think about sulfur dioxide, because the amount of sulfur dioxide is, uh, that is present is um, very much in molecular form is affected by the pH. So at pH 3.0, there is around 6% uh, sulfur dioxide in molecular form. Whereas at 3.5, it's around 2%. And then at 4, which is actually getting fairly, um, uh, fairly well, for wine, fairly low in its acidity, it's only around 0.6%. And this is where we actually start to talk about the difficulty of protecting your wine when the, uh, the pH is in fact a higher number. There may be more problems with things like um, microbiological spoilage, bacterial spoilage, which tend to like these conditions with, with higher pH uh, levels. And then measuring acidity on the next slide just here. So acidity can be measured and expressed in many different ways, but the most common measure that we talked about on the previous slide is something we call T a, so our total acidity, uh, which is, as mentioned, a sum of all the acids. Although there are many acids present, uh, the result will usually be expressed as the equivalent of grams per liter in tartaric acid. So total acidity is typically around 5.5 to 8.5 grams per liter, but of course can be higher than that number. Uh, and you'll find in things like Chablis, for instance, that number can hit towards nine and 10, and certainly Champagne. And you'll see that I've just taken off any kind of um, technical analytical data sheets here, and it gives you that information. So sometimes you'll find this, and it says here 5.4 grams per liter in this Reserva Syrah. So that's nearly in the typical range that is given in your level four text. Uh, and also in France, the total acidity may be expressed as sulfuric acid, the ratio between the sulfuric acid and the tartaric acid. 
1 to 1.15. And then measuring pH we have here. So if total acidity is measured as we've just mentioned in grams per liter, uh, pH is a scale of measurement of concentration of the effective acidity, the effectiveness of the acidity in solution. So wines typically have a pH of somewhere between three and four. That's quite normal. And on this chart, which is a little bit difficult to see, you've got acidity at zero to alkaline of 14 and neutrality is number seven. You'll see battery acid, uh, things like gastric acid, lemon juice, vinegar. Um, hydrochloric acid in the stomach at around two, grapefruit, orange juice and soda at three, uh, and then things at around uh, three to four. Wine would be typically in this kind of uh, orangey area. And then it goes up, all the way up towards uh, up, up here and then through seawater, baking soda, uh, ammonia, soapy water, bleach, and then finally drain cleaner at the end of alkaline at the end of that. Uh, so wine's typically between three and four. Uh, the pH scale is an inverse scale. So the lower the number, the more concentrated the acidity, uh, and normally the sharper the wine will taste. Uh, and the scale is also logarithmic as well. So uh, it, uh, a pH of three, for example, is 10 times more acidic than a pH of four. Uh, and pH levels affect, like I mentioned, a range of key parameters in wine making. So low pH increases the microbiological stability in the wine and increases the effectiveness of SO2, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, but also additional things like it gives red wine more stable color. So it gives that kind of brighter red color and also can enhance a wine's ability to age well. OK, so that's just the components yet. Actually, throughout the wine making section, we will go into details about these in greater detail. This is just skimming the surface, really, of the main wine components. I do hope that you found this useful for your level four studies. As always, if you do have any comments or questions or concerns, you can get in touch with me here at Wine with Jimmy by the, um, the comment on the YouTube video here by social media that you see at the bottom of every slide, or you can get in touch direct at www.winewithjimmy. Until next time, I've been Jimmy Smith, and if you do find yourself in London, you can come to a school or a wine bar that I have. Come and see me for a class, a glass, or a bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith. Thank you very much.